Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition, episode number three of the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. We hope that you are safe and doing well. Uh, some news coming out this week that Major League Baseball may be starting its season late June, early July, so the light is at the end of the tunnel. And we hope we're providing a baseball fix for you. We do appreciate you for joining us and making us a part of your day, however you are listening. I'm Jim, and joining me, as always, is my hitting mentor, former instructor, friend, and coach, renowned hitting instructor, co-host. He's also a coach, too. He's also my, my, my broadcast He should be a broadcast po- podcast coach. <laughs> renowned hitting instructor, Jake Epstein. Jake, how are we doing? I'm so happy to be a co-host. That makes me feel great right now. Would, would you rather be my podcast coach or co-host? Co-host, for sure. Yeah, because you had the experience coaching me. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> You know what that's like. I mean, I did attend University of Missouri for a while, you know, number number one or two journalism school in the country. So, you know, I, of course, I didn't major in that. But, you know, it makes me feel good to be a co-host. Speaking of Major League Baseball, by the way, uh, there's some news that came out about a former Major League Baseball player, arguably one of the best of all time, Jake. Manny Ramirez, at age the tender age of 47, going on 48, is thinking about coming back and possibly playing in the... There's been multiple reports and, and, and different sightings, but uh, in the Taiwanese Baseball League. And I just want to throw some numbers here out at you. 19 years for Manny Ramirez, 2,302 games, 555 home runs, and take... Let's put aside the fact that he was caught for performance enhancing drugs, whatever that was, in 2009. 1,831 RBIs in his career, and he slugged 585. I mean, he's arguably, and I, I, he's not in this conversation enough, even. He's arguably one of the best hitters of all time. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Manny's always been a hitter, but he's always been controversial. You know, I mean, from the time he climbed the wall and gave the fan a high five after he made the catch, you know, and yeah, dropping yeah. balls in the outfield, throwing around base. He's just, he's that kind of polarizing personality. But to be honest, from a hitting standpoint, uh, he would hit third in any lineup that I could create, you know, with all time players. The guy could flat out hit. And one of the smartest, I mean, you could have a conversation with Manny and be like, wow, this guy's, you know, he's a little, he's a little off. But I'll tell you what, when that guy gets in the box, he knows exactly what he's looking for. I remember they were playing the Rockies, I don't know how many years ago. He was with the Dodgers, and the sequence was great. It was like first pitch fastball right down the middle, and he took it for strike one. Second pitch fastball right down the middle, he took it for strike two. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? Third pitch, curveball down the middle, he was – his timing was right on it, perfect, hit a double into right center field. And you could totally tell that entire bat he was just sitting on a breaking pitch. He was sitting on a break pitch. Everything else was – he didn't really care about anything else. You know, he tunneled that breaking pitch, you know, based on fast at-bats with the guy, you know, he was facing or whatever. So when you mix – and, and, and again, everybody has a different idea of, of swing mechanics, but he's – you know, if I were to make a perfect hitter, he would be – pretty much towards the top of that. I mean, that guy, that guy did things. He was so short to the ball. He had such great extension. He was so powerful. Um, he had a very smooth stride and rhythm, even though there was, you know, a leg kick there. So uh, when you couple that with a guy that has a plan, you know, you get Manny. I totally think he can hit. I think he'll probably get hurt unless he's feeling really good about his supplements. You know, I mean, he's going to he's gonna be hurt. He's going to, you know, he's probably not going to be as strong, but – that the dude could hit he'll be successful he's got good vision 47 julio franco did it right so i think uh i think man ram could do it too you know with i've seen videos online with him and talk about him maybe getting hurt you know he's actually and i don't know if you've seen videos of him online though he's in he's in better shape than he was when he was playing in his 30s well, he had a baggy uniform, so we never knew That's what kind true. of shape he was in. That's true. Yeah. I wonder, uh, if, he I wonder is if that'll great translate. Shape. I wonder if that'll translate to his new career in in Taiwan when he's playing that baggy uniform. That was always kind of a uh, Manny being Manny attribute, though. And everybody always talked about, hey, he's just Manny being Manny. Well, part of to me, part of being Manny being Manny was the fact that he was so confident at the plate. He always had a plan, like you mentioned, and it was that. That confidence that he breamed, but that he was so relaxed and so focused, that's also part of Manny being Manny, too. And that's how he hit 
fastballs on the black of the plate, outer half, out of Fenway yeah. Park. And, you know, it's Cano, there was all those bad marks on Cano when he was getting graded out as an amateur that he was lazy and he, he didn't care and he didn't work hard. Well, he worked really hard. That was just his demeanor. Yeah. That was just – and relaxation – my goodness. We talked about that last episode, yeah. you know, with Mickey Mantle going to the plate. And he may have had a few beers in him, you know, every time he went to the plate. But <laughs> he was relaxed one way or the other. Yeah. By the way, Manny Ramirez, in 1996, 1997, this is what astounded me when I looked at his baseball reference card. And this on, is on, Indians time? On, and this, this, is is Indian, this is Cleveland time. And by the way, if you, when you look at his baseball reference page, there's black numbers litter, littered all over, meaning that he led the league in multiple mm. categories. I don't think he ever led the league, though, in home runs and batting average, which kind of surprised me. But in 1996-1997, he had 309, 328, respectively, 33, 26 home runs, 112, 88 RBIs. And in those two years, he wasn't an all-star at all. In today's game, you're more than an all-star. You're probably considered a top-10 MVP candidate. And quite honestly, you probably would you probably would have hit more home runs today, you know, in smaller parks and harder baseballs, maybe. Um, he was so good, but he was a defensive liability for the most part, you know. And yeah. um, and he had the he had he had the reputation. I'm bummed because uh, a good I'm going to give a good friend of mine a shout out here, Justin Parker. I grew up with him in Southern California, and he told me we were into baseball cards when we were young, and he's like. You got to go get this guy named Manny Ramirez and Rondell White. I'll never forget this conversation. I remember going to the card store in San Juan Capistrano, buying those two cards for, I don't know, four or five bucks. And uh, Manny was on the fast track, man. I'm like, this is the greatest investment I've ever had. And then now that card's worth like, I mean, it is, he looks like a little kid. It's like a Bowman card and it's probably worth like $12. (laughs) <laughs> and it was worth hundreds of dollars, you know, at one yeah. time before he got busted. So that's 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 my Man Ram uh, claim to fame right there. I want to tie up some loose ends from last week's episode. Uh, the one thing that uh, I love that you mentioned, uh, and I thought about this uh, during the week, how you talked with Charlie Lau Jr. And your dad, Mike Epstein, and Charlie Lau Sr. were on opposite ends of the spectrum in regards to many things hitting. But when you and him got together and you guys were talking hitting, it was like two guys, two baseball guys, like say, when I I see this a lot, with two scouts who may disagree from different organizations on a certain player, they're getting together and talking baseball, talking shop, but they have that mutual respect for one another, even though they disagree. And I think that shows on your part and on Charlie's part, uh, first of all, that you guys grew up around big league, players but also you grew up around the game and it shows that you have humility and i think that's something that's sort of missing in today's game with people that are entering in the game and on hitting twitter and pitching twitter and it's just refreshing it was really refreshing and if in case you missed that episode go back and and take a listen um it's available on apple Podcasts, google spotify etc um i think that's something that's missing though in today's game and it was good to hear that um you have that humility not that i i know you i knew you always did but it was a refreshing story hearing you and Charlie talk about hitting, even though you guys are opposite on things. Somewhat. There's a, there's a lot. Yeah. And there's uh, communications key and, and everybody has their own preconceived notions on what, what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. And hitting is no exception to that. Uh, um, and today with social media, sometimes being polarizing creates more followers which could create more business and so i think uh, i've never and i'm not very uh, savvy with social media and i'm not very opinionated on social media to create those stark contrasts i look at it all the time and i'm like oh my god i can't believe that yeah. or you know i can believe that so uh there's a story one of my certified instructors and i love these guys because we got a couple hundred of them out there and you know a lot of times i was their first hitting guy, you know, and I kind of started them with the information and then all these other people, you know, pop up, right. All these new guys or younger guys or super duper social media savvy tech guys. And so one, one of my best, he's, he's actually a very good friend. He's like, Jake, have you, you know, done some of this? Have you, have you seen this guy? You know, I had him, I had him come into the facility once and do a thing and, you know, God, I, I thought it was great. And don't you think this move and that move and, 
And I'm not going to say, you know, obviously the different names and what the moves are because everyone will know. And I was like, Jason, it doesn't work, man. He's like, oh, yeah, but if you see this, don't you think that would engage this and that? I'm like, it, it, it just doesn't it, – it's not going to work – when you crank that machine up or you hit, okay. So anyway, a year and a half goes by and I make another visit to his facility. He's like, man, that stuff didn't work. <laughs> He's like, that screwed up so many of my hitters and it probably helps some hitters too, but it just doesn't work for everyone. And, and so I've always been the, you know, what, what works for you? You know, here, here's a big leaguer. Here's what they do. You know, you can get all crazy with these moves and that moves, and you can try them. I'm a big trial and error guy. Hey, let's try this off a of tee. Oh, did your bat speed change? No. Did your risk go up? Yes. Do we keep that fix? No. Okay, so we, we're constantly moving through that pattern of trial and error and figuring out what's best for that player. Some players, we talked about it last week, can have leg kicks. Some players can't have leg kicks. Some players have to do a no stride. And some players need that momentum and athleticism. So you have to teach the player as an individual, and we can't blanket that. And that's where the, the whole evaluation comes from with, with what we do is, you know, we video, um, you know, we'll put some data, we'll put some, you know, blast on them, we'll, we'll put them off the hit tracks to, you know, if we want to see exit velocity. I'm not as concerned with launch angle and stuff with the hit tracks um, or total distance by any stretch. But, um, you know, what is, where are we starting from? And where can I see growth? And let's attack those areas of growth. Maybe it's a lower body. Maybe it's an upper body. And then let's test that. Did it work? Yes. Okay, well, we found our path. Let's go ahead and build that path in. Yeah, and, and thank you for, for that because you just, just showed how smart of a hitting instructor and, and um, professional hitting coach you are. And because, you know, you were one of my first hitting guys, I guess, so to speak. And... I think we're we're forgetting you guys, not so much me and not so much you. I'm not a coach, but I think some coaches are forgetting that we're here, you're here to help the player get better. It's not about really the coach. Unfortunately, that's that's and you guys are have have things that are hard enough where getting players to listen, getting players to buy in, that's hard enough. And now you're adding in all the other extracurricular activities. It, it just gets ridiculous at times. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's hard being a, and I, I have so much respect for the, um, the coaches, you know, day in, day out, whether you're at the college level or the pro level, because you're handling, you know, 15 different personalities, yeah. 15 different swings. I, I just love the fact that a few years ago, they went to having an assistant hitting coach. You should probably have two assistant hitting coaches, just guys on deck that no hitting, that it was just too much work for one guy to do scouting reports, to keep track of video progress of his players, who's going to slump, and quite honestly, being a, a psychologist, because a lot of times that, that's what it is, you know, talking these guys off the ledge or going to dinner with them to try to kind of calm their nerves and, and, and figure out what they're thinking. There's a lot that goes to the coaches, and I really, uh, they're the most underpaid guys in, in in major league baseball it's it, it's sad that i read something recently that they're they're going to cut their salaries and cut a lot of the payroll of the coaches and those guys are making peanuts compared to the to the players or the front right. office guys and it's that kind of made me sad i was like we need to get the season going just to keep these coaches employed for the amount of work that they do yeah well said. Uh, speaking of scouting reports, I've done 50 to 60 over the last three years uh, just on my own, uh, having that access, working in for a professional major, a major league team. And I did a little bit of a scouting report uh, last week when you and I got off of the uh, episode. We finished the episode, got off our, our call last week. I happened to log on to Twitter. It's, I guess it's just become habit these days because of the quarantine. There's really not much else to do. <laughs> That and looking at workout apps and training apps. But I was on Twitter, and I noticed Baseball America, which always posts great content. J.J. Uh, uh, Cooper, a friend of mine, um, he posted a video of Ronnie Mauricio, who is the number one prospect for the Mets, and he's number 62 overall, according to MLB Pipeline and all of Major League Baseball. And I, I did write down some notes. I did a brief, very brief scouting report on him. I watched some video last. This is just based off video. It wasn't in person. And... Some of the things that I wrote down, good hands, fluid hands, good first step quickness in the field, strong arm, can get to the shortstop hole and make an accurate, strong throw to first. But 
offensively, he's a switch hitter. And from the video that I saw from the left side, Jake, he looks a little bit like Victor Martinez with the way he tucks his front shoulder when he's loading. The leg kick that he has, although Martinez had the toe tap, his inward turn and his coil is very, very similar. But the, And his right-handed swing, you can make the argument, is smoother. But the thing that stuck out, and it's a mechanic that we talked about last week, it is bat lag, and boy, does his bat whip through the zone. That is just pure, unadulterated bat speed that he generates and that energy through the barrel. It, it was a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, I, I saw someone uh, that... I don't know if it was JJ posted. It was a it was a Baseball America thing yesterday, and it was about the top Latin prospect. And I I, I don't remember oh, so many names. Anyway, but I mean, this kid was like 165 pounds, hitting bombs with wood bats. You know, not 400 foot bombs, but over the fence, 370, 375 foot bombs So the opposite field. Yeah. And you looked at his swing, and it was like he this guy's. He is not exerting a lot of energy, and that's that's the smoothness and that's the whip. The first thing you said about him was smooth hands and loose hands or something, you know, in your scouting report. Well, what makes that? Yeah. I mean, how does a guy have good hands? My daddy used to talk about it all the time. What 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 makes good hands? What does that mean? Oh, he's got quick hands. Yeah. Does that mean that he creates a lot of torque initially, and so his upper body comes through? Is it how he releases the barrel? Is it how he launches? Does he have a short launch or does he, you know, there's a lot of things. What is it called? Tipping the barrel, right? Throwing that barrel back towards the catcher, which I'm not, um, I'm not a fan of young players doing um, just because of strength. So, you know, what makes good hands? It's usually lag and barrel release. It's that simple. And that thing really accelerates the barrel at the end, but you have to hit the ball out in front. Um, and if you've been following the, the, you know, Poor Yelich got sucked into hitting Twitter yesterday, and he was, you know, about the launch angle, and I think we'll cover that next week. But, um, you know, he's like, you got to come in maybe a little bit steeper, but you got to hit it out in front to get elevation. Okay. That, like, opened up. I could have written a 400-page uh, essay on that comment yesterday because most guys that have steep attack angles, when they hit the ball out in front, it goes in the ground. Okay, think Brandon Belt. Every ball that he pretty much pulls is on the ground to the right side. Think about most left-handed power hitters. Why is there a shift? Because when they hit it out in front, a lot of times they hit a lot of topspin ground balls or line drives to the pull side. Well, that doesn't create launch angle. For them, hitting the ball out in front does not create launch angle. Okay, does not create, I shouldn't say launch angle. That's not true. It, it, everything creates a launch angle. It doesn't create a higher launch angle. Okay, when you think of Yelich and you think of Justin Turner, those are guys that hit the ball way out in front, but they hit the bottom of the ball. So what part of the ball you hit makes a huge difference when you hit it out in front. And if you're too steep out in front, unfortunately, you hit the top of the ball. You don't hit the bottom of the ball. Yeah, in future episodes, uh, we will be talking about attack angle versus launch angle. Also, with Christian Yelich, too, he is one of, if you ever hear him speak about hitting, I think he's just absolutely brilliant. I, there's a guy right there that, under without overthinking, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I, can't get, I can't get into his mind, but he doesn't seem like he overthinks, but he, he knows his swing. He understands not just how to swing a bat, but understands how to be a great hitter. Yep. And that's the thing. You gotta you gotta know what you do best. You can't worry about what other people do best. Because his thought process, of course he is an MVP and hits three twenty and yeah. thirty plus home runs. But you have you know, versus a Chris Davis, uh the A's Chris Davis. We'll call him a Fullerton Chris Davis, because I have okay. some roots there too. Uh, but totally different mindset, right? Like Chris Davis dumps the barrel early, he just steps in the bucket and he hits bombs to the opposite field. So, you know, know what you're good at. And then you have to stick with what you're good at. It's like me. I don't hit a hook very well when I golf. So I only choose courses that uh, Nicholas designed because they're all dogleg rights instead of oh. uh, runs. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you, you can't be a worse golfer than me. I've broken three golf clubs before just at the driving range. So That's I'm not because excited. of your incredible club leg <laughs> 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 yeah. and, and, and club speed, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that because I have yeah. no idea about uh, much about golf. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, we're gonna we're gonna dive into Christian Yelich swing in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, before we start 
our our topic today, our, the episode, uh, of course, uh, where's all the torque gone? We're talking about the torque in the swing. I do have some good news, Jake. Um, the podcast, it's available on Apple and Google Podcast, Spotify, and other smaller podcast platforms. Our YouTube page, we're still trying to get that up and running for whatever reason. YouTube won't let me upload our previous episodes and clips. We will get them up there, though. It's the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to that. We're also now on Tune in radio, the Tune in radio app, tuneinradio.com. I I have the app and I listen to college, well, on Saturdays at the gym. I'm working out on Saturdays. I'll listen to college football games. I'll listen to other podcasts. And our podcast is now available on the Tune in radio app as well. So we are rapidly expanding. That is uh, very very good news. Be sure to subscribe uh, to uh, all of the. Uh, for the for all the episodes, uh, previous episodes are still available. Last week's clip we talked, or last week's episode we talked about the absolutes and uh, some mechanics of hitting philosophy as well. So be sure to check that out. It was a very good episode. All right, let's get into our topic this week, though. Uh, it is torque in the swing. And I posed this question as the title because I don't see it being talked about really much anymore. There are other words, other synonyms for torque that are being thrown out there. But where is all the torque gone? And for me, I wrote this definition down. Torque is a twisting force that causes rotation. And it's a word that your father applied to the swing with the help of Ted Williams, and you've used it in your your teachings as well. Just take me through the history a little bit, sort of a small history lesson about where the word came from and how you and your father now apply it in maximizing a player's bat quickness and bat speed. So originally, like most things, came from... Ted Williams, um, he talked about the hips leading the hands. Mm-hmm. You know, what What does that mean? That was that was his absolutes, right? Hips lead the hands, be on plane with the pitch, and stay inside the ball. Those three things is what my dad spent all of his time on in the late 90s when he was teaching players. How can we find a way to teach those things? So what did he do? He figured out, well, if your hips lead your shoulders, then that creates tension on your body. Um and that's torque, right? Yeah. So that was it was a word he he made up. Like it was like rotational hitting, right? I mean, he, he didn't make the word up, but as it was applied to hitting, he made it up. And he used to say it's if you take a rubber band, and now everybody uses this analogy, but nobody mentions my dad who came up with it. But if you take a rubber band and you twist one end one direction and the other end the other direction and you release it, it creates energy. And so the first drill that we did was called the torque drill. And we would start with our hips open, facing the pitcher, and we'd wind our shoulders until they were closed and you would feel tension on your core. Um, and then you would unwind that tension. So that was, uh, that was groundbreaking for players because it had them feel like they were getting through pitches because they weren't really taught to open their hips much. They were taught to kind of more shift their weight forward versus rotate their their energy around so that's where torque came from and that was uh you know groundbreaking that was that was his drill the torque drill now people call it separation uh yeah. they won't really call it torque because they 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 want to brand rebrand things of their their own means and they they have the feet a little bit different and they snap you know, they, some people call it the snap where you snap your hands back. There are people that would use hand torque instead of body torque. So, again, two forces where the top of the barrel goes one way and the knob goes the other way. That would be considered a big barrel dump early. Yeah. Um, but hand torque is, is okay, like depending on when it's ap- applied to, um, to the swing, the timing of it. If it happens before the body, that's usually not too good of a move. But um, so it was kind of a buzzword um, going back, but it was uh, it was my dad, like yeah. no doubt about it. Like, let's do this drill. What's it called? The torque drill. Okay, make a video of it. You know, if you want a DVD or a cassette tape, first in two, the year two thousand, you know, it was it was it was Mike Epstein that came up with that, and in fact, that drill is what got him the letter of recommendation from Ted Williams. Yeah. Because it was so different and kind of off the mark to use the body that he was like, man, you, you're seeing things that most people don't see. Yeah. I was going to bring up torque with the hands uh, mm-hmm. a little bit later on, but you mentioned it. So let's get into it right now. What, first off, we can. there's a lot of branches to this tree, I think. But what what exactly is hand torque? Because there is some some twisting that is going on 
with not only the lower body to the to the uh, upper body mm-hmm. at the in the waist and hip area, but also with the hands and the wrists when you're when you're loading um, mm-hmm. just in general with the swing. And Bonds was really good. You know, he had kind of that that hitch or that hand. Well, Williams did too. Yeah. Um, you know, what people talk about. You know, the the hand. Yeah, you know, you talk about torque in cars, right? You know, the, the you know the the twisting kind of motion that you sure. had mentioned. Um, I'm not sure there's really twisting on the bat in terms of the hands on the bat, but um, it's usually you know it's those forces. It's the top hand pulling one direction and the bottom hand pulling the other direction on, on the object of the bat. So, like if you do it, you know, right when you go to rotate your shoulders, and then that bat is in a vertical position, and that bat becomes more horizontal. Essentially, there's some hand torque involved there. Um, if you do that with, uh, you know, a, a 78 pound kid, he's going to drop that barrel down to his back knee and the pitch is going to be his belly button and he's going to have trouble. So you do it with a big, strong guy who will do it more with his elbows. Like Bonds was more of an elbow, like his elbows rocked right up and yeah. down and that moved his hands. Um, you know, there, there's some good action there. And then when you go from your lag position, your bat lag position to when the knob turns the corner, that could be considered, you know, hand torque as well because your right hand is moving forward and your left hand or your top hand is moving forward and your other hand is moving, you know, more back into the side. So you can get as crazy as you want um, with hitting, and people do. There was a guy I ran into years ago at a convention. His whole philosophy was called wrist hitting. Set the wrist, release the wrist. Okay. All right. Like, maybe it works. There's, I mean, there's, there's, that, that, there's a move in there. But when you talk about it, like one of the things that I fight all the time is I fight the top hand coming over the, the left wrist right after contact. Like that's one of the big, big issues that players have. I did some analysis this morning on some, of my, you know, my personal guys, my amateur guys that are, you know, 13 or 14. I'll give them a shout out. I'm not going to give their names, but they're twins from Southern California. You know who you are. And they both have kind of the same same move that we're trying to fix with their with their arms, and it's great. We've only they've been members for uh, a month, and I haven't had to break down their swing. I've pinpointed the one issue that keeps them from being great because their lower body works well and they rotate well, but the six inches, the three inches before contact and the three inches after contact is where they fail with their move, and that's the move we're trying to fix. So. Could that be considered a hand torque move? Do they have too much of it or not enough of it? Yeah, I don't, I'm not really sure. I don't teach it. We'll put it that way. I don't. I let the body move athletically, and if we do things correctly, the the bat should follow. You know, the hands should work correctly if we do our drills correctly. Meaning, I have a, a loose hands drill that I do with players where they load them and then they'll kind of throw the barrel to feel that. Uh, I saw Mark McGuire posted something great, or he did a Zoom meeting with somebody talking about hitting a fungo, and all he was, all he tried to do. This is Mark McGuire, who his. I wish we knew what his average launch angle was the year he hit, you know, seventy home runs, because sure. that's a moonshot guy. I mean, that dude really was steep out in front, like he really lifted balls. He had the barrel underneath, and he lifted them because he was a monster, right? Well, what about? Him talking about, yeah, man, I was trying to take off the pitcher's knees all off season with a fungo. I put yeah. it on a tee and I tried to take out the pitcher's knees. That's what he worked on to hit balls at 35 degrees all the time, 40, 40 degrees. Yeah. So to, to each their own, you know, that's what he had to do to, to keep him kind of in check where maybe other players have to try to swing up more to keep them in check. Who knows? We don't know until we analyze that player and we get to talk to that player and we see that player. Off topic. What do you think McGuire's swing plane? Well, how is his swing plane? Number one, number two. What do you think his attack angle would have been? I know that's kind of a tough question to answer, and also I hate to ask it, but what do you think his launch angle would have been as well? Because it seems like I saw that video too. Yes, he's yeah. working on. He's working kind of like Yelich a little bit. Wow, I guess down. internal cue, yeah. kind of working down towards the baseball and up through it. Yeah. Well, so what do you think those what do you what do you think about all the, the questions I just posed? Ah, I wish I could I was a huge Ace fan, obviously, you know, because my dad the first time I was exposed to baseball, I actually wasn't that I mean I was young, but I wasn't that I lived on a ranch in in Oregon. Um and 
all of a sudden we, I never played baseball. I didn't have a mitt or anything. I, I was probably five or six years old, seven years old. And we went to an old timers game. We went to the city, we went to the Bay area. And it was like, what is this? this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And my dad's like, at that point we had to trade in your horse for a glove because you never wanted to do anything else except play catch. So, yeah. you know, I was hook, line and sinker with the A's. And then obviously the Conseco thing and McGuire was there and Ricky Henderson and Dave Henderson and Lanceford and Phillips and all, man, that team was awesome. But, um, yeah. I don't know. I think, you know, he was, he collapsed his backside. So, McGuire never got off his right leg, and the the one visual that I remember of him is his right foot was funky. It folded in. It never really came up off the ground all the way. Mm-hmm. So his back knee kind of collapsed in instead of rotated down and in. Um, he did drop the barrel in his back shoulder a lot because of that move, which put him under the pitch plane most of the time, which is where he needs to be because of his size. But what he didn't do was he didn't get too steep, I don't think, out in front. Mm-hmm. So when you drop underneath the, the pitch plane and then you swing up a lot, like an attack angle of 15 to 20, what happens is you'll hit a lot of topspin balls. But he hit a lot of moonshots. So what that means, he dropped under. He, you know, so he, when he missed, he always missed under. Okay, So he would he swing under, but then he wouldn't come up he wouldn't overcorrect and swing up too much. So he would constantly hit the bottom of the ball, creating a ton of backspin and really high fly balls. So I would say his launch angle on his home, you know, on most of his home runs were probably 30 to 40 degrees, maybe even like mid, mid to high thirties most of the time. But I think his attack angle was still probably in that 10 degree range. I think it was how he approached it. Um, Where, where Yelich will come in much flatter because he doesn't collapse his backside, you know, that's that's why Yelich doesn't miss under very often. That's why he, what did he say? You know, guys are throwing 100 miles an hour at my belt. Like, yeah. this is the only way I can catch up to that. That's a different mindset. Like, 100 miles an hour, Mark yeah. McGuire, I love you. But that would have been a really tough pitch for, that is a tough pitch for anybody to hit. But, yeah. you know, a riding four-seam fastball would have been tough. He was a really good, he played, in a sinker slider day, and that's how his his swing, you know, that's where it caught it. You know, he was a good low ball hitter. Yeah. People don't really uh, bring that up, though, about how back in the, I would say back in the day now, because, I mean, it still feels like yesterday. Yeah. But, uh, 98, I guess, well, I, I don't know, 95. I was still very young at the time. 95 to 2003. Well, well, guys didn't throw as hard in, in, in that era of the game. Well, yeah, but you just made a great point. They threw a lot of sinkers and a lot of sliders, and now the emphasis is on more so velocity. Yeah, and the game, is it always evolves. I mean, if you yeah. look at – my dad and I always used to look at, you know, old-time swings, right? You know, you'd see Garrick, right? You'd always see Garrick very upright, you yeah. know. Um, you'd see guys, Ty Cobb, very upright and flat. Remember the catchers in those days? They didn't squat. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. They weren't yeah. in a full squad because they were on their toes, up. right? They were on their toes. They were on their toes. In a way, yeah, they were like up. Yeah. They were like in a three quarter squat, and the and the the mound was super high, right? So they were throwing. It was a high fastball league, and that's why when you saw a lot of the guys, you know, probably prior to nineteen forty. They were all high ball hitters, and when you're a high ball hitter, your back foot drags a lot, your shoulders don't drop as much, and your and your attack angle is going to be zero to six degrees. And then all of a sudden, they lowered the mound in '69, and those high fastballs now were getting destroyed. Yeah. So what happened? Okay, everybody started to throw sinkers and sliders, and then all of a sudden, the hitters finally adjusted in the '90s, and they started to catch up. And then there was the big, you know, if you want to call it the steroid era or whatever. But guys were hitting home runs. And, and then where did things change? And then everybody's taught, hey, lift that ball. You got to get down and get that ball down at the knees. Now everybody's like, you yeah, know, pitchers are smart. Okay, let's go back to that riding fastball. Yeah. Throw as hard as we possibly can. And let's see what happens. So, you know, hitters are usually a few years behind, you know, what the pitchers are doing. That's why you got to have your hitting coach and your pitching coach talk once in a while. Hey, what are you guys working on? Because I guarantee right. you, everybody in the league's working on that same thing. 
uh, in case you're wondering, yes, we will go through the history of hitting. We will have a full episode on that as well. That'll be a, a fun one as well. We'll do that in a few weeks. All right, back to the topic at hand. Sorry about that. I just wanted to just to get your opinion on. on Sorry, the I got to jump in. Sorry, Jim. I just had a thought, and I don't want to upset you know Bailey Hemphill, you know my favorite player. Softball. Okay. Softball players has a have a much flatter swing plane. Okay. Okay. Because of the pitch, right? The pitch is thrown from it doesn't i mean the rise ball will rise it jumps out of the hand don't get me wrong that thing is vicious and if you swing at a rise ball that ends up above your belly button you're toast like that thing really might jump on you but for the most part everything still does sink okay so it's not like you want to swing down to get on plane with softball but my softball players usually there's like if you watch the really good players their swing planes are very very flat very very yellowish like um and that's why i always say i really love softball players i i I, I don't know if it's because they're over taught, you know, hand path or swing plane at a young age, but it, it helps them with the flatter trajectory. So um, of the pitch. So with baseball players, you know, I'm looking at attack angles five to fifteen. For softball, I'm like two to twelve. Hey, torque is and separation. That's all the way across the board. It's also very prevalent in some of the highest level softball hitters as well. Yeah, for sure. In fact. Girls are so much more flexible than than guys typically are that they will really maximize that torque angle at, at launch. They can really keep that front shoulder down and in as their front hip starts to go. What age do you start teaching torque and, and separation? So let's say somebody listening, a father listening to this podcast comes across the labbcs.com or mm-hmm. Epstein Hitting on Facebook, EpsteinHitting.com, and they their, their kid – is eight years old. Let's fast forward even for 10 years from now. I say, hey, Jake, we're doing our, our 2000th episode of the Epstein, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. And I say, I want my, uh, oh, don't laugh, my friend. You're stuck with me now. <laughs> <laughs> but I say, I want my eight year old son to hit with you. Mm-hmm. And the, he doesn't obviously have the body control, he doesn't have the flexibility that it takes to maximize that torque, but they still want to start to learn that. So what's a good age to start to learn that? And if it is eight, nine years old, how do you go about, uh, without giving away all your secrets, Mm -hmm. how do you go about doing that? Because obviously their body is not as mature as even a 10, 11, 12-year-old. Yeah, it's funny. You put a 10-year-old in the the K-Vest unit, Mm -hmm. and you look at their, their report and their numbers, and um, you know, it shows that they actually rotate faster than, than fully grown men, than big leaguers, you know? So people think, wow, that's great. This kid is, but it has to do with how wide they are. It has to do with that sensor on the back and how far it's moving compared to speed. You have somebody with narrow hips versus somebody with wide hips. Um, kids rotate for the most part. Like I, I haven't had a kid where I'm like, buddy, you need to rotate more or a girl. You need to rotate a lot more. So I've tried to simplify it because everybody now, if you look on hitting Twitter, is spin the, you know, load up the right hip you know, or the back hip and then spin that thing out. You know, open, your, you know, get the left hip or your front hip going up and around, you know, swing up, get the front shoulder, which is, which is how your body rotates, right? I remember there was a, a, an article, Peter Gammons, it was like a conversation with Peter Gammons, Ted Williams, Don Mattingly and Wade Boggs. So you got to look that up on on uh, Google or something. And they were talking about and Boggs is like, oh, I got to swing down. Mattingly's like, I, I chop down. And Williams is like, you guys are a bunch of clowns. Like, <laughs> you, there's no way you do that. Oh, that's what I, I try to swing down. I know, but nobody used video all that much then, right? And Williams is like, you can't do that. Like the pitches, I guarantee. If you look at Mattingly, he, there's I, I never saw a swing where he swung down. Okay. But in his mind, that's what he was trying to do. I guarantee you, George Brett, you know, and Lau, you know, his Lau disciple was kind of the same way. He didn't swing down. He rotated, you know, it, but it's, it's, it's how you train. So um, uh, getting back to where was I? <laughs> where am I? You're talking about Ted Williams and yeah, and before that, swing I was, uh, plane, and we we're discussing um, the, the – um, the separation of younger kids and then oh, the separation they, of younger yeah. kids. Okay, good. Yeah. So that's good. Cause that's what happens in my certification training. I just go off and I'm like, what were we talking about? Okay. So to the young kids. So 
the big thing with the young kids is they rotate. Their front hip opens and they turn. Now, typically, if players are are the same side thrower, they, they throw right-handed, they hit right-handed, they throw left-handed, they hit left-handed, their hips know how to work because they've played catch 10,000 times by the time they're that age. Okay, So you know, what is the issue normally? The issue is normally their upper body. So what I try to do instead of creating what most people do now is they're creating – more open with the hips, I try to create more closed with the upper body because that is the trend of what's going on. It wasn't always that way. Don't get me wrong. 20 years ago, it wasn't that way. But today, it's I got to keep that chest facing behind their belly button. I got to keep that chest facing behind their rear foot when their hips kick in. So instead of forcing, I'll say, look, we need torque. We need to separate our shoulders from our hips but I don't necessarily do a ton of drills focusing on that. I'll do a ton of drills getting their sequencing of their upper body staying back longer. That's the, you know, one of the biggest, I shouldn't say the, the biggest issue is bad drag when it comes to mechanics, but the upper body, lower body sequencing is probably number two. And, and if your upper body goes too soon, you know, imagine you're playing catch and your arm is coming forward before your front foot plants all the way. Okay, like you wouldn't really have any resistance to throw against. So that's what's happening in hitting. Players' upper bodies start before their front foot really posts up. So that sequencing is what I would work on a lot with your eight-year-old daughter because you're probably not going to have any sons because you talk to me all the time. You know, anybody that spends time with me never has sons. It's just the way it is. So that's that's it's like the the Epstein curse in a way, isn't it? It is. You just have to pay for weddings. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> However, yeah. I will tell you, softball is way more fun to coach than baseball. Girls listen. They do what they do. Hey, go pick up those balls. Okay. You tell yeah. the guys, the, the boys to pick up the balls. They're shooting hoops and wrestling right. each other. Like, it's right. off. I, I love the softball classes that I teach because they yeah. just, hey, do this. Okay, coach. Yeah. Oh, you guys I, used to do, I used to do the, uh, when picking up baseball, shoot it into the bucket and say, you know, Kobe. Kobe. Baseball. Still Kobe. happens. Right. And then when, you know, unfortunately, when, when, when he passed, you know, the, the Kobe's came back. And I couldn't yell at anybody because I'd hear Kobe from 50 feet away in the cage, you know. It took him 25 yeah. minutes to pick up the balls. And it's like, all right, you know, we'll give it a few weeks. Yeah. I wouldn't mind having a daughter who, who went to UCLA and on a softball scholarship either. By the way. <laughs> I think that'd be all right. I want to make that clear. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cues, especially for these younger kids. When, when – they're trying to learn torque. What kind of mm-hmm. cues do you use in trying to teach them the separation between the upper half and the lower half? Uh, what I'll tell them to do is I'll tell them to feel their front foot land, mm-hmm. which may not make any sense. But what happens is kids just kind of swing. They're not aware of where their body is in space. So I'll, I'll tell them, you know, try to feel your front foot, right? Because we have, and, and I got to go back to, you know, high school science class, but, you know, you have all your, your, your nerve endings, right? And those nerve endings all connect to one each one another. And sure. what is like the farthest nerve ending from your brain? It's probably your front foot when you're swinging, right? Sure. So that nerve, that, that feel has to go all the way through your body to your spine up to your brain. And as fast as a processor we have, it ain't that fast. Okay. So there's going to be a, oh, now I have to swing. So a lot of times I'll have players feel their front foot land cognitively before they're allowed to swing. So they're thinking, step forward, there's the plant, now I can swing. And that is so hard to teach and so hard to get. But once they can feel that move, Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden everything kind of whips through and they'll start to get that sequencing down. So that's the move. Now, sometimes I will still put them in the torque position just to feel that tug. Look, I want you to feel the tug of your, your upper body staying back. This is why we have to do it. Mm-hmm. But just doing that drill all the time, which I see, I see people do that drill with their, their both feet are like, and maybe it's great. I, I might be missing the boat here and, and, and should be teaching all my players this. But they have their, you know, both feet are like, you know, their hips are parallel to the front of home plate, right? So the hips are wide open and the feet are parallel to that line too. So they're not like in a hitting stance and then they turn their, their upper body back and then they just kind of dump the barrel and swing. 
um, to feel that move. Well, that's not a move. You know, maybe that would be a good stretching move or something like that feel. But I don't do anything crazy like that. If I put them in the torque position, it's it's more of a modified. This is your launch position. Like if if we look at Yelich at heel plant, or we look at uh, Acuna at heel plant, or we look at uh, Bouchette at heel plant. This is the position. We're not going to really overdo that position. We'll get to the actual one, and then you can kind of feel it from there. So I'll break it down a little bit. I don't. I definitely don't overstress that move because, unfortunately, when your left foot is or your front foot is too far, the the foot itself can be open as much. I don't really care if the front foot is open, but if the whole leg is open, mm-hmm. all players just spin off and come up and out of everything, and they don't hit anything out or third. You told me 10 years ago when I asked, I said, I don't feel the torque. Is that proper? Uh, I didn't use those exact words. but yeah. um, And you and you said, you are not. You shouldn't feel the torque. Just trust me, it's, right. it's there. And we looked at it on video, and we saw the separation. We saw the shirts stretching, and we saw that it was there. Does that still hold true, that you really, when you're in the act of swing, there's a lot of things you shouldn't be feeling. You should be <laughs> just be trying to hit. You shouldn't be trying to focus on the feel, obviously, but... Um, is that still is that still applicable? Is it you should still just kind of feel that bat whipping through the zone and just trust that you have the torque there? And when we see it on video, there it is. The ball didn't lie. You know, the ball didn't lie. If you're hitting the ball well and you're hitting it pretty far, then there's probably torque in there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't feel it. You know, when I feel it when I when I hit fungos for the first time in a while, or I go play golf for the first time in a while, I feel it the next day. Where it's like, ah, oh, the whole front side, left side of my obliques are sore. But yeah. for these guys and for young players that are hitting every day, they're they're not going to feel that soreness, and they shouldn't feel it when they go. Yeah, that, so that they, would be an artificial move for sure. So if you haven't swung in a while, so let's say I go in the cage mm-hmm. after after our episode here, I mm-hmm. go in the cage and I start swinging. Am I going to feel a little bit of soreness in my obliques? Yeah, or I most sure definitely. I should. I should. Yeah. Okay. And, you, and, and, if, and if you go do it right-handed, because mm-hmm. you're a left-handed hitter, if you were to go swing right-handed, you really feel it. You probably yeah. wouldn't hit anything, but you'd really feel it. So that's why it's so crucially important for players to work both sides of their body. Um, when we do med ball throws, um, that's where I really get them to feel more of that stretch. You know, It might not be with a bat in their hand, but it'll be with a med ball. Where we're doing exercises, I'll have them step to launch position and then really let that upper body throw throw that med ball, but we do it both left-handed and right-handed so that we're creating, you know, kind of even, even muscle build on both sides of our body. Otherwise we get, then our balance and stability really gets off. All right, Jake, let's take a break and let's talk a little bit about EpsteinHitting.com. We've got the LabBCSHitting.com, or LabBCS.com, excuse me, which we talked about, your facility in College Station, Texas, last week. And for more information on that, check out the LabBCS.com, but also EpsteinHitting.com as well. What do you have going on? So uh, the EpsteinHitting.com is, is our for our instructors and, and for my remote players. So I have a couple hundred players uh, from, geez, age seven. I might even have a six-year-old from California who's a stud. His name's Jason. I have to look at his video today. Maybe they're listening. Um, but, yeah, most most players around the, you know, anywhere from, like, I don't know, I'd say eight to 18, something like that is, is kind of the, 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 the main age group. But they'll send in videos, and, and every day I look at them, and I voice over them, and I give them a, a plan of attack and drills to work on. And, again, it's totally customized based on their needs. Not every, It's not boilerplate, hey, buy this program, and here's 10, 100 drills you can work on. It's so how the Epstein you know Online Academy works. Uh, the lab, we're going to open up May 11th. We're going to do super small group. Very excited to get back to training. I did a poll of my 100 members down there, and 98% of them said, please open. So we're doing a small group. We're going to get get going again with our small group training. We're only going to have like four kids in there at a time. we got 8,000 square feet. But we're going to get everybody training, keep everybody safe, keep everybody busy, getting better. And then we're also, uh, I'm going to open up some out-of-state stuff. So I've had a lot of interest from players outside of, you know, kind of that, that uh, College Station, Houston, Austin area. 
uh, that that want to come in. They're, they can, you know, if they drive, you know, ten hours, they'll drive ten hours. But we're going to do some week long training, do some live at bats. We're going to get into a lot of college players this summer um, to keep them sharp because they're canceling summer ball as as well as you know, obviously the college season. So that's kind of what's going on uh, with us. We're excited to get back to to the in person training for sure. So for more information, log on to EpsteinHitting.com. Once again, that is EpsteinHitting.com. And like Epstein Hitting on Facebook as well. All right, you mentioned some other exercises that you do with guys to help them out with torque. And one of them being med ball throws. As much as you can tell me without giving away all your secrets. Of course, I said that earlier. What other exercises do you do um, to develop torque? Taking the bat out of the hand and just focusing on the body and getting that prepared for this high-level move. Yeah, I mean, you can do re- resistance bands are really good, you know, to get players to kind of feel that, that move where you can put the bands behind, you know, around their hips or around their shoulders. Um, some people do, like, they'll use a PVC pipe or something they'll hold on to and they'll stride away from it. Sure. keeping their shoulders back and then open their hips. Um, you know, we do a lot of explosive, like just leg training, box jump type, type work, you know, j- uh, you know, jump squats, you know, anything to really build from your hamstrings to your, to your obliques. You, you can't build that strength enough. And then at the same time, try to keep that, you know, uh, flexibility in there as well. Cause most big leaguers, you know, I think we talked about this last week, you know, when my dad first started, he and Tom House used this company called Biokinetics, which may still be around. It was in Laguna Hills, California, I think, at the time. And that's the stick figures. Like, whenever you see the original stick figures, this guy, uh, the guy that owned it, I remember his name, Tony Stedham. I was just a kid when we used to go there. But, you know, they would have this library of all these old major league players, and they would turn them into stick figures so they could see actually how their hips worked. And that's where torque was really seen. Um and, and that process is, God, oh, it's so crazy now. You know, we can put sensors on people and, and get those actual numbers and those tilts and whatnot. So um, anyway, that's uh, – torque is – there's so many different pieces of that. But, you know, major leaguers, I remember when they, uh, when they first measured, I think Griffey was like 40 degrees. Like he was the, the highest. But Jeff Bagwell was like 30 degrees or 28 degrees. And so they said, you know what, how you're built plays a huge process, you know, a huge process in what that number is. So guys that are tall and lanky, Williams, they're going to get way more torque than a guy like, uh, you know, maybe Manny Ramirez that was was a little thicker. However, you look at somebody like Miguel Cabrera, who's thick, strong, massive, and he's still got upper 30s degrees of separation. That's why it looks like the dude hardly swings. Yeah. Biokinetics, by the way, I just looked it up, is still around. If you want to Google that, but yeah. yeah, they are still around. But so I, I guess what I what I got from that was some of the some of the things that you mentioned there, combining the biomechanics with and this is combining data with with practical information. And it kind of makes sense now as to why lanky guys have really good power because and that they I guess uh, they're wiry strong, as as they say, yeah. uh, because they can generate so much torque. Where Manny Ramirez may not generate as much torque, or Miguel Cabrera, he still generates a lot of torque, but he's more thicker. But he's they're both they're really strong. So I guess right. both do both play a role in a factor. Absolutely, yeah. Usually, the stronger the guy is physically, mm-hmm. the yeah the more muscle structure he has um you know the less torque at least from the data that we've looked at and then you have somebody like our, uh, Mickey Mantle who is obviously a hero of so many people including sure. myself sure. you know so i read a lot of uh, books about about the mick and so mickey mantle who was who who was you know uh, obviously a big hero of mine and read a lot of books about him his muscle structure was was too advanced for his his skeletal structure, mm-hmm. and that's why he had so many injuries. That's why he broke down so much is because he was so strong and his his bones couldn't support him. And I find like you know imagine these guys now that are so big and so strong and they they work out on top of it where he was just kind of a naturally strong guy, and it, it's tough. It's like a it's a really tough. Um, bridge to piece together 
between, you know, how strong is too strong and, 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 and do we lose flexibility? And then where does the leverage part of it? Like Griffey never lifted weights. My dad never lifted weights. In fact, he said they were, they weren't supposed to lift weights. They didn't want guys to get too bulky. And now we see that, you know, weights are like totally essential and you get stronger and so does your, your bat speed increases and the ball goes further. Um, you know, what, what is the trade-off there? What is, and then you see these Latin kids that are 155 pounds that, that hit balls, you know, 350 feet already. And it's like, well, as soon as they get to 190 pounds, they're going to hit it 400 feet. Yeah. So, you know, what is it? Why do some guys have it and some guys have to build it? You know, I, I was in the minor leagues during the steroid rush. And I mean, I, you know, be done with the day, getting dressed, showered up. I'm like, my God guy's a monster and i was a big guy and it was like this is the most unathletic dude i've ever seen in my life you know like he just looked good in the uniform so i I wish i knew the the secret to that you know to keeping guys healthy while also keeping them strong yeah i i guess now with weightlifting there's a lot of mobility and flexibility drills that are involved that help guys guys and gals be be loose when they're swinging and just playing the game of baseball in general what about the feet uh you taught me. Uh, some guys still teach uh, finishing. They, well, they don't even teach it at all. They just they just let their hitters finish closed and and just kind of throw caution at the wind there. But what about the feet? You taught me to have my front foot, which is my right foot. I was a left-handed batter to be slightly open at a forty-five degree angle. And you look at all major league hitters, uh, most of them anyway. They that's where their front foot is at 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 uh, toe tap or toe touch and, and uh, heel drop. So um, what about the feet? How do they play a role in, in gaining as much torque as you possibly can get? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the winner, there was a study on this a few years back, and they said, should you stride, and I'm talking about the step now, should you stride straight ahead? Mm-hmm. Should you stride towards the plate? Should you stride open? Okay, so those three variables. Should you have a closed front foot, which sure. means it's facing straight across home plate? Should you have an open front foot, 45 degrees? Should you have a fully open front foot, 90 degrees? Okay, 90 degrees would be totally facing the pitcher. And if you look at Major League players, they fit all of those categories. There's a guy that, um, I don't know if he's still there. He was there with the Brewers last year, Spangenberger. He's got a brother who's like a prospect, I think the Brewers just signed. But Corey was the one I was Corey. thinking of. Mm-hmm. And I have a picture of him when he was with the Padres and his when he first came up. And his front foot is like completely closed. Like I had never seen, it looked like his knee was going to pop out of his pants. Like it looked like it was so uncomfortable. Um I, I, and I have that clip too. We can we can look at it down the road. But he was, you know, like the first guy. Most people don't know who he is, right? So maybe it's because of his really closed front foot. Mm-hmm. Um, but he would have to force it open, even with Bonds. Bonds used to have a, a front foot that was probably less than forty five degrees open. But as his front hip initiated, he would spin on his heel. So when you see guys that spin their front foot open, mm-hmm. usually that's because they landed closed. And the inertia of their hips is opening their front foot versus Donaldson, who opens his front foot almost all the way, 90. Yes. Okay. But Shet's probably somewhere in there. Then the front foot will kind of stay there. It won't have to open as much. So getting back to the the ground uh, force test, the stride that created the most energy was a stride that was slightly towards home plate. Okay. So a dive but a small dive, maybe a two-inch dive, with a front foot that was open 60 degrees. So what, what about the dive? Let me, let me just touch on that for mm-hmm. a second. So the dive, you're meaning with the upper body. So in other words... Uh, no, the foot. I'm sorry. They're okay, the foot. Towards okay. the, yeah, they're stepping towards the plate with their front foot. Okay. Yeah. I Does know what part... you're saying with the upper body, but yeah, this would just, just be lower body. So what I try to get my players to do um, is we keep our toe line. So when we stride, when we're, whether you start an open or square, okay, mm-hmm. I don't have my players start closed with their stance, right. but if we they start open or square, last week, right? Yeah, right. if they start open or square, when they land with an open front foot, I like forty-five to sixty. Mm-hmm. Their toes have to be at least parallel to the inside batter's box line. That means because if you just open your foot and you draw a toe line. 
it'll be facing more to the pull side. So you have to compensate from the open front foot by stepping towards the plate just a couple inches. So that's what I have my players do. Quite honestly, I've never had to tell my players to open their front foot. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've never, mm-hmm. I, I really, that is not an issue anymore. Okay. Once in a while, I'll get a left-handed hitter that's a right-handed thrower and their lower body is just a mess. But if you play catch, you open your front foot and you point it towards where you're going. If, and most kids always pitch, and when they pitch, they don't step with a closed front foot. So typically with most kids, the front foot is good. Getting them to step the right direction because they typically pull out, that's another story. Okay, And that sure. most people would say, well, that creates more torque, right? Let's think of Chris Davis right now, A's Chris Davis, Fullerton Chris Davis. He steps in the bucket. He opens his front foot. What does he have to do to compensate for that? He really has to keep his front shoulder down and back, down and in for a long time. That's the most difficult part when I'm teaching kids. That's the torque, and it has to do with keeping the upper body in position. That's more difficult for me than having them open their front side. How about a pre-swing coil? So in other words, when you're striding, leg kicking, what about the coil and uh, Ted Williams did this too with the back hip and creating that separation. Um, what can you tell me about the, the coil in the pre swing movement? It's really important. Uh, Williams called it a counter rotation. You mm-hmm. counter rotate your upper body away from the, away from your hips, away from your, uh, away from the pitcher. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many crazy terms I hear for it every single day when I go on Twitter Mm-hmm. You got to load your scapula and you got to do this and pronate that and supinate this. And I don't know. Okay. That sounds super scientific. I should probably listen to everything that you're saying. Okay. <laughs> but essentially you got to get to a, it. It's, it's your, it's, it's your load, right? Like it's, yeah. I'm getting ready to stride. I'm, you know, I'm taking my hands and shoulders back. They used to talk, you know, the old school dudes, uh, when I was in the minor leagues, was walk away from your hands, you know, push your hands back. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that either. So it's, you know, essentially what you're trying to do is getting your upper body to resist your lower body. And how you do that, you can do that anyway. If you want to get super scientific and it works, do it. If you want to say, hey, take your front shoulder and tuck it down and in under your chin when you stride, which was like, that's like some old school Griffey move, older school, um, why can't I think of his name? Joe Morgan move, you know, where they really okay. tuck their front shoulder. That's kind of how the old school guys, Julio Franco even did it with that crazy, you know, stance that he had. So, yes, a little bit of a load or a negative move or a rearward move with your shoulders and hands is really important. Essentially, what I'm trying to get to is you can't be stagnant. And when you plant, right, when mm-hmm. style ends, do you have a hitch? Do you have no hitch? Do you have high hands? Do you have low hands? Right. All style. Do you twist your shoulders back or do you tuck your shoulder down some of that is style but when you get to the launch position and your front foot plants and your front hip wants to it starts to open your front shoulder better be lower than your back shoulder and it better be closer to home plate than your back shoulder your front shoulder must be closer to home plate as well so what's a good move for that back hip to cock when you're striding even if it's just what my stride was very simple move Mm -hmm. to towards the pitcher falling i don't want again not gliding but falling for there is a difference. Yeah, and you know, gliding is not bad too. Drifting is not good. Drifting is right. not good. The uh, the the back hip. So what what you want to make sure of is stability in the back leg and hip. That's usually where I see most issues. So when a player lifts their front foot, if their back knee starts to wobble or face the wrong direction, if their back foot starts to wobble and it's not flat, pushing down into the ground then the back hip isn't stable. The back hip is also Chris Iannetta was the first guy I ever noticed with this issue. If you watch, uh, it's better now, but you watch his swings with the Rockies, you'll see that knee do some weird stuff. And you know what? Sometimes Yelich's back knee does some weird stuff too. It, it like yeah. a lot. Yeah. So it's not a perfect science, you know, with a kid, we're trying to make them perfect. Um, but yeah, like, you know, taking the front hip typically, if I need a player to do that, I'll have them think about their front hip more than their back hip. So I'll have them, as they pick up their leg, I'll have them cock their front hip in okay. a little bit. And that will usually take the, the their back hip kind of back and down a little bit or back and around. Um, or quite simply, you can just have them kind of get to a crane position. <laughs> you know, they'll lift their front leg up and you, I'll have them balance there. Mm-hmm. And then I'll throw them like med balls. So we use a, a lot of the... the, uh, the the BOSU ball a lot. 
mm -hmm. um, for stability where we'll throw them, you know, med balls in different locations. We throw them ping pong balls. We throw them all kinds of stuff so that they can keep their feet very stable. And then we'll hit right after. And it's amazing how good their balance will be if, if you have a player that is real wobbly with their stride. Mm -hmm. And you're only going to see that on video. You're not going to see that full speed. Right. And then you take them to the, that balance station and stability station, and then they start to kind of figure out how to control their body. And then you take them right back to hitting. All of a sudden, they'll start to kind of, fix that move without necessarily you know concentrating on it 120 percent so when you pick up that take the bat out of the hand so i have a pen uh -huh. in my hand that's my bat uh -huh. so i'm gonna put that i'm gonna put that down for a second and i'm just standing here in my stance and now i'm i'm striding or kind of cocking my hip i have to be balanced on that back leg how do i avoid my shoulder my front shoulder turning in too much and now creating a longer bat path so it's usually never too much at heel plant, mm -hmm. but it is a lot of times too much during the stride, like you said. Okay. If a player, so I wouldn't worry about this, number one. Off a of tee, I would worry about it. If there's somebody throwing them a ball physically, they can't keep both eyes on the pitcher and, and turn too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so off a tee, you know, you can turn your head back and look out of the corner of your eye and kind of hit that tee. Yeah. But if they're looking out in front and they try to, like, turn their shoulders or upper body too much, their head and their nose is their governor. So right. you have to keep their nose on the pitcher. Don't let them look out of the corner of their eyes. Try to keep their eyes flat if they're doing it too much. Okay. Makes sense. I just did the move myself there. Good to know mm -hmm. when I, when I plan my, my comeback there. There you go. <laughs> Your scouting reports. That's right. That's right. I wonder what the Blue Jays would think of my uh, my supposed comeback. Um, anyway, uh, moving on here, let's go to the upper body. And you've talked about this on your videos on, on the Epstein Hitting Facebook page, EpsteinHitting.com as well, about the front shoulder and how that plays a role in torque too. And it has to be down at an angle. I don't know the exact degrees, but at, at an angle to help – create more separation yeah and you know i mean you can go back to you know buttermaker and the bad news bears yeah. <laughs> probably probably said he probably didn't say it but you know keep your shoulder in right i mean yeah. they've been saying that since you know somebody picked up a bat double they decided to you know chart off 90 feet you know, yeah. keep your shoulder in. Like, that has been, oh, and it will, okay, keep your shoulder in. What does that mean? Well, it usually means we're swinging too soon before our foot hits the ground. Our upper body's starting, our sequencing is on. That's why players don't keep their shoulder in. So, yes, some players are different. Mike Trout uh, keeps his shoulder pretty down. Griffey really kept it down. Typically, guys that are more upright will have it down more. Guys that are wider will be a little bit flat, like Yelich gets really wide, you know, his will be flat. Um, it can be five degrees down. That's it. It doesn't have to be 30 degrees down. It just has to be down. And what I look for more than anything, and this is why the new sensor stuff, whether it's, you know, K-Motion or K-Vest or my swing, which is the one uh, we use down in Texas, we use K-Vest too, or 4D Motion, which is kind of a new one that's um, pretty good as well and very affordable. It puts a sensor on your sternum. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that. It puts a sensor on your on your spine, the top of your spine, between your shoulder blades. And that will tell us how far back our upper body is facing. Okay? okay. So if I can keep that, you know, if you have a logo at the bottom of your neck between your shoulder blades and, and that logo is essentially facing the pitcher a little bit when you turn. You're good. Okay. It means that your upper body is closed. Okay. So why why isn't I, I don't know? Maybe I'm missing it, but why isn't torque being talked about as one of the most important factors in the swing anymore? I mean, we we mentioned it earlier that all these words are being thrown out: supinate and mm -hmm. and supon and and I don't know. He was a pitcher. What, yeah, he was Jeff Supon. He was a pitcher. <laughs> I think I just I just gave a new a new new term hitting term. Um, you know, but I always say I'm, I'm always wondering where's torque. What about torque? That's and yeah, separation. I, don't think I mean, it's not torque. You. It's both though. It's torque and separation. They're not talked about enough as being one of the most important factors in a swing in power, and and it drives me nuts. Why is that? 
Well, I'll, from a major league standpoint, everybody has it. Right. Right. Okay. If they didn't, they wouldn't be major leaguers. Mm-hmm. So it's not a huge issue at, at that level. It's a huge issue sometimes at the scouting level because we can see if, is there room for growth? Number one, maybe that that's a positive. Wow, this guy hits the ball really far and he doesn't really have any torque. Okay, so, you know, that's a, that's a benefit. We can fix that. Or this guy has great torque and has no power. Okay, well, he's not athletic. You know, like he's, he's, not, he's not the right guy. So, you know, at, at a younger age, it's more important. But, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Maybe – Maybe the term, I didn't do a good enough job with my social media uh, campaigns mm-hmm. 10 years ago when when my dad, you know, or 20, well, there wasn't social media 20 years ago, but, yeah. you know, when it came out, I, I think yeah. I think there's probably other terms with it. It is being taught just yeah. because I see different drills with it. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I think to work, you know, people ask me all the time, what, what, what's more important? With torque, because torque means that you've kept your upper body back as you've taken a stride. Yeah. Okay, so to me, that's really important for adjustability more sure. than anything. Like, oh crud, the hair, this is a 85 mile an hour cutter instead of a 90 mile an hour fastball. Can I buy myself four inches? You know, mm-hmm. can I wait four inches longer? That's how I wait. So without torque, you have no adjustability in your swing. Um, and without torque, you're, you're limiting your power. But like I said, you know, everybody is a little bit different. Like I can't make, I couldn't make, uh, Jeff Bagwell have 40 degrees of torque. Like that's not going to make him better. The fact that he has 30 is great. If he had 10, that would be awful. Okay. Uh, if, if Griffey, if we were like Griffey, you're at 40, you need to be at 50 or you need to be at 30. Like there's no exact number for the player. You just, if you're in range between 30 and 40, you're usually good. Yeah. And if you're under that range, it's usually a catastrophic issue of sequencing. It has nothing to do with, like, we could practice. Okay, so for instance, I have a kid that uh, has zero torque um, when they when their front foot lands, okay? Or maybe they have negative torque, meaning their shoulders are more open than their hips, okay? Mm-hmm. That has no, I could put him in the torque position. But that's not going to help him sequence his body or time his swing better. Like he'll right. be, he'll look great in the drill. Drills are great, right? Drills are great yeah. if they serve a purpose, right? Everybody just drills now. Twitter is like, hey, let's hit off a tee in front toss. Hey, that's like yeah. all I see. How about like let's crank up a machine and watch a guy fail and see how he deals with that failure, and then see if he can catch up to ninety five. Like if we crank up a machine to ninety miles an hour. You know what you're not going to do? You're not going to hit eight out of ten balls. Like you're going to hit like four out of ten because they're darting too. They're not like in the same spot. I want to see what you look like off of ninety out of a set of ten strikes. I don't expect you to hit seven of them or eight of them hard, but when you hit three or four of them hard, now I want to look at your swing there. Yeah. That's telling me what they're doing and what's right. So now I'm totally off bases here. What were we talking about? Again? Well, the one thing Sequencing. that. Well, the one thing too, if I if I may just cut in, the one thing that that our organization does really well, and this was something a factor that was added last year in player development and at the major league level too, in batting practice, and teams are starting to do this. I don't know about the Brewers, but teams are now starting to throw out there some batting practice pitchers who throw really hard that and have like guys players right and have mm-hmm. guys hit off those pitchers to get them ready for the game instead of just the normal batting practice. Yes, there that there's a time for that, I believe, but that's in the cage, and that's what front toss is for. Mm-hmm. But there's got to come a point where, let's see how you look, even in batting practice, let's see how you look off, off game speed. Yeah, and it's, I mean, this is a whole other topic of player development, but um, yeah, I'm a big fan of, you know, my guys... You know, uh, last year, like what we would do is we would we would do our and not a ton of reps, but our we'd have a routine, right? Yeah. We do maybe five or six bottom hand swings off a tee, five or six top hand swings. We would do some no legs drills off the tee, just kind of feeling barrel release um, and swing plane, and then we would go into front toss and do some front toss. Yeah, and then we would gas. So I think the one. 
the one B, the the one part of practice that doesn't really it doesn't really fit because front toss you're working on something. You can be cognitive on a thought. I'm working on this. I'm working on that. T you could be regular BP. You can kind of work on it, but that doesn't regular BP just gets an arm going. That's all it's doing. Sure. Sure. Um, so it's hard to replicate that velocity is great, but 90 off of a hack attack is like a hundred and 10. No, it's like, it's yeah. like a hundred miles. An hour. It's hard. 90 off a hack right. Attack indoors. Whoo. Yeah. That sucker's moving. Right. Okay, that's like that's way harder. When you see ninety coming out of a hand in a game, guys are like, "Oh, this is nothing." So, you know, how do you replicate ninety? <laughs> well, you got to get an actual pitcher out there. So, right. big leaguers, I, I wouldn't say it's easier, right? Because most pitchers are awesome, but every day they see it. Every day they see it. You know, twenty-eight days a month they're seeing that speed. A college guys going to see that maybe. You know. They're going to see a lot of speed, you know, maybe two two days, you know, maybe Friday, Saturday, maybe a closer midweek, something like that. But, um, you know, they're used to it, where an amateur player is, is not. So it's, it's, it's a tough way to train. It's a good way to train. The 45-foot batting practice that I throw is pointless because I don't throw very hard. I'm six foot five. The ball's dropping at, like, 15 degrees. And that's not a normal swing plane, right? When I set the hack attack at, you know, 90 miles an hour from, you know, say 55 feet, which is release point, never set your machine at 60 feet. Nobody throws a ball from behind the rubber or at the rubber, right? They throw <laughs> yeah. it from out in front. You know, that ball is only sinking about six degrees. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, so with golf torque, uh, we mm-hmm. got off on a, we got off on a tangent there, so I apologize. But yeah, um, no, no. Uh, there's a lot of I mean there was a lot of uh, topics that we can talk about later on, um, and and that I wrote down that I think are great. But you mentioned earlier golf uh, and the torque that golfers generate. How similar is golf torque to to hitting torque? Because the swings are obviously very different uh, in some instances. Yeah, and 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 some instances are they're very similar. You know, I mean the front arm isn't you know obviously yeah. golf you don't have to adjust. Right. Yeah. You can lock out that front arm. You've set up your radius and it's time to go. So yeah. your sequencing can be perfect if you put a KBS on. So golfers create more torque because they can turn back as far as they possibly want because that ball's not moving. Mm-hmm. Right. The ball's just sitting there. So golfers are going to get like uh, 60 degrees of torque, you know, I think has been measured. So I don't know what Rory would be, you know, it'd be off the charts with his flexibility and power. So sure. Um, the intangibles are still there. The ground force is the same. The lag and release is very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that, and, and you can attest to this, is um, baseball players that play golf typically slice everything. Yeah, and that's the one thing, and that's where the release doesn't come in. Okay, so that that's a player that stays inside. Like Derek Jeter, I'd love to watch Derek Jeter play golf. He's probably yeah. a stud now because he's a freak. But I wonder if when he really started to play, he just hit high slices on everything, you know, because the inside yeah. out, he never really released that barrel all the way. So, yes, there are some com- commonalities. Um, obviously, the ball's on the ground, you know, so our hands work a lot lower and our posture is a little bit different. But um, from a torque standpoint, absolutely. If you If you don't have torque, you will have zero power. If you don't have torque, meaning your hips don't lead the way, yes. your hips don't go before your shoulder, your club won't slot in the right spot, okay, mm-hmm. which would be considered staying inside the ball, okay? Mm-hmm. So it's called club lag, which is like bat lag. So if your first move is with your back shoulder, with baseball or your right hand, with baseball or golf, you're, you're toast, Okay, that first move has to be left side. I'm sorry, it has to be front side. Front hip goes front hip, front foot, front obliques, Mm -hmm. front shoulder, front arm. Then the backside comes through. Again, going back to double day, right? When you were taught (laughs) taught how to hit, what did they say? The bottom hand is for control. Nobody talks about this anymore. And the top hand is for power, right? Like if you're going to punch somebody, you wouldn't punch them with your bottom hand from a baseball stance. Right, that's right. The, that's your guide. That's to stay inside the ball, and then your top hand. When that comes through later, that creates the power. 
You know? yeah, that, I mean, that still holds true. But if your first move is to start with your top hand before your bottom hand or before your front hip, that creates bat drag, that creates barrel dump, and that creates casting. Same as golf. Golf has casting too, or they call it over the top, a different move, which would be not staying inside the ball. So um, sequencing is, is very, very important with the front hip. And that is the definition of torque. That front hip has to start to open before your chest or your upper body starts to open. And it's not, it's not like a second, you know, we're talking about milliseconds. Well, good stuff today. Uh, Where's all the torque gone? I think we kind of answered everything about where it's gone. It's still there. It's maybe it's just not as prevalent. Maybe it's not taught as much, but that that was some really good stuff there in in trying to help people understand what torque really means and, and how it it accompanies a high level swing. Absolutely, it, it is there. It may not be taught the same way. It may not be stressed as much when you're watching TV. But I'm I, I think the majority of of coaches now. Um, they want some kind of separation. I really think that's, and that's a good thing. Like that's, that's something that's not overlooked. They might spend too much on it and overdo it, but I will say that it's, it's, it's not lost at the young levels. It is lost at the upper levels when you're listening and watching broadcasts. You mentioned bat speed earlier in the show, just kind of touched on it a little bit. Well, next week's episode, we're going to be talking about bat quickness and bat speed and the difference between the two, I have an opinion, a, a pretty solid opinion on that, and you taught me this a while back, and we're going to get to that next week. I'm really looking forward to that episode. Bat quickness and bat speed, there are similarities, but guess what? In my opinion, there are differences too. Yeah, there, there are a lot, and, and weight of that bat, mm, mm-hmm. that's the big role. That'll be a fun topic next week. We'll be talking about that next week. Don't forget to follow us on all of our social media channels on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Jim Tara. Jake is at Epstein Hitting, Epstein Hitting also on Facebook. Give it a like. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast as well. Uh, New episodes every Monday at 9 a.m. Jake, great job. And we'll talk to you next week. Any last words, of course, uh, before uh, before we depart? No, if I have last words, we'll be here for another 20 minutes. So we'll see you all next week. Yes. Everybody stay safe. Light it's, the light is at the end of the tunnel. Stay positive. Stay safe. And we will talk to you next week. Take care.